South Wales, May 6, 2001. 31-year-old Jason Williams hasn't been seen for 12 days. And he certainly would have been in touch at least by phone. Police arrest two men, secure witnesses and obtain damning DNA evidence. But this is no open and shut case. There was no body. Could Jason still be alive? With the police unable to find him, his family turned to a local psychic. But will the hard science of the police or supernatural skills find Jason first? quiet commuter town on the south coast of Wales. A person doesn't have to be missing for very long before somebody notices. Unemployed father Jason Williams has not been seen for four days. His sister Julie is worried by his lack of contact. Jason was a very family-orientated person, very devoted to his son. Um, he was very much a hands-on dad. He certainly would have been in touch at least by phone to speak to his son. So that was when the alarm bells first were raised. Detective Chief Inspector Ken Isaac has lived and worked in the area for most of his life, an area where serious crime is extremely rare. A missing person report in relation to Jason Williams commenced in the village of Lacha. There were general house-to-house -house investigations and speaking to his family and associates. So we were expected from an early stage of the missing person inquiry that he would be found uh, within a week or so. Most missing persons in the UK are found within three days. After a week, the police still have no definite leads. The family grows desperate. We're leaving messages on his mobile phone for him. Um, obviously, every time the phone rings, you wonder, is it the police ringing with news? But uh, everybody kept an open mind that perhaps uh, he's gone visiting somebody out of the area. After nine days and with little information from the police, Julie takes advice from a relative and contacts psychic Sue Evans to see if her worst fears are true. Psychics have the ability to speak to spirit, so that if that missing person is dead, then the psychics would be able to communicate with that dead spirit. If she was a genuine article and could do what she said she could do, she might come up with a piece of information that would lead to finding him, so there wasn't any decision to make, really. Right Sue claims that rust. tarot cards focus her psychic intuition and will allow her to discover what happened to Jason. I use the tarot, like some people use a crystal ball or tea leaves, and it's a way of me linking into their lives and finding out what's happened to them. To me, the tarot is how I communicate with spirit, as well as being able to predict. Out of the 78 picture cards, Sue turns over the image that most strikes fear into those not familiar with the tarot, the death card. The death card means change. It doesn't always mean death, but it does mean change. But because it's next to the moon, which indicates sadness to me, it does mean that there is a sad changes around you. This is the chariot, which means trauma. This is how you feel at the minute, as if everything has tumbled down around you, which is caused by all these preceding cards. And this is the nine of uh, swords, which indicates stress to come along with this. The cards did show us that there was trauma around Jason, but we weren't absolutely positive as to what had happened. But it does indicate that something has happened. So we'll have to remote view this if you want at a later stage. Usually if people have, as she put it, gone over, she can pick them up fairly quickly. But I think you are always aware as well that there are charlatans out there that will prey on people's grief and make claims that are not true. You know, it's not going to be cut and dried. It's one of those situations that it may take a while to get to the bottom of. Sue says she can sense a disturbance around Jason, but is unable to contact him in the spirit world. This is a ray of hope to Julie that her brother may not be dead after all. Twelve days after his disappearance, Sue tries to contact Jason again. She figures that where one psychic has failed, two will succeed. She calls upon her sister, Kathleen. We're asking Spirit to help us to find what happened to Jason. Sue uses remote viewing 
an unproven phenomenon that psychics claim allows them to witness events from a spirit's point of view. We ask for protection and a gold light around us to help us work. When I remote view, it's like watching a video or a television. You see details. You can see the layout of furniture. You can see the layout of rooms. You can pick up the atmosphere, which would lead up to a murder. You can then watch as if you're standing there as a witness. Sue claims she is transported back to the murder scene with Jason as her spirit guide. I found myself in a, in a living room and there was an older gentleman there and a younger gentleman as well as Jason. I see that there's a bit of agitation going on between Jason and the younger man. What the psychic doesn't know is that her visions seem to match details revealed by a local man who has been brought in by police after claiming he witnessed the murder. This started as a missing person investigation, and I always kept an open mind. Uh, is this a missing person investigation, or is this a murder case? Alan Sinfield says he was there when Jason was viciously attacked by 27-year-old Richard Davis. Sinfield and Jason uh, were friends. There was a vast uh, age difference, uh, some 20, 20 years. What he told us is that um, they'd been drinking uh, at his house. Davis and uh, Williams had an argument over the fact that uh, Davis saw Jody Sinfield's telephone number in Jason Williams' phone. All of a sudden, it erupted like a balloon going pop. And there was a struggle. Davis pulled Jason Williams onto the floor, uh, straddled him. And he was just sticking the knife in him in his chest and things in some kind of a vengeful, nasty way. With no apparent knowledge of Sinfield's confession, Sue describes an older man and a younger man in the room with Jason, then a drunken murder. She has no doubts what this information is all about. Jason wants to ensure his killer is brought to justice. There is an element of wanting justice done because somebody had taken his life. It's 12 days since 31-year-old Jason Williams was last seen alive in Lahore, South Wales. This missing person's case takes a dramatic turn when a 57-year-old local man, Alan Sinfield, is interviewed by police. This was turned into a murder investigation, primarily from the disclosure by Sinfield to the police, saying that Richard Davis had killed uh, Jason Williams and he was a party to the disposal of his body. For 24 hours, these details are not released even to Jason's family, yet somehow, psychic Sue Evans' vision of the murder appears to match Sinfield's confession. The police remain open-minded over what has happened to Jason. And we weren't sure at that stage, was he involved in the murder? Did he alone do the murder and blame Richard Davis? And they were things that uh, we were hoping to clarify. Richard Davis was also arrested uh, that, that night, and he was given an opportunity to uh, give his version of events. Davis protests his innocence and claims that although he had an argument with Jason, he left Sinfield's house with him still alive. The interviewing officers felt uh, it was a challenge, uh, as if it was uh, some type of game with him, uh, or challenging the officers during, during each particular interview. The police act fast and send in forensic teams to Sinfield's house. Now both Ken Isaacs and Sue have terrible news to deliver. One of the most difficult jobs for me was uh, speaking to the family and telling them that uh, he had been killed. Initially when we heard that he'd, you know, been stabbed. It happened, like, probably two streets from where I lived. Um, it was very strange to think that all that was going on in such a short distance from your home and you didn't know anything about it. We knew that these people had been charged with his murder and I didn't feed that information to Sue because if I did that, I would never be able to know whether she was genuine or not. I have to tell you that I have been in contact with Jason's spirit and I feel he has passed over, I'm sorry to have to tell you. Sue tells Julie about her vision of Jason being in a room with two men and the drunken stabbing. Her details match the facts that the police have revealed to Julie earlier. With regard to the information she's come up with, um, the accuracy of it, I can't logically tell you how she could come up with all those details. Jason's spirit 
also seems to be providing Sue with more clues that could bring his killer to justice. And Jason was pointing out that there would have been parts of the room splattered by the blood, and some had splattered onto a radiator. With regard to the information she's come up with, um, the accuracy of it, I can't logically tell you how she could come up with all those details. We need to see now what's happened to him since. Julie is won over and approaches the police about working with the psychic, but they refuse the offer. My take on the psychic involvement is that uh, a psychic did, did not assist the investigation, and to my knowledge, Southwest Police has not used a psychic uh, to help to prove uh, any inquiry. Yeah, I think, you know, police have their hands tied by procedure, by budgets, by professional guidelines and, and standards. I mean, families are not tied by any of those things. Frustrated by the police's response, Sue and Julie launch their own psychic hunt for the body, led by the spirit of Jason. The key to any murder investigation is identifying where is the attack site and where is the body deposition site. We had an attack site, but we didn't initially have the body deposition site. Without a body, the police could not be confident of convicting anyone for murder. At Sinfield's house, the forensic team have a breakthrough. If we moved back the carpet, and uh, we found there was two large pools of blood, with, and under the radiator were some small dots uh, of blood. Sue claims she predicted there would be blood close to a radiator. For her believers, this is proof that the psychic has access to the world of the paranormal. Psychometry is a controversial technique that supposedly allows seers to explore psychic imprints of objects touched by victims. Will this help Sue find Jason's body? She calls in her psychic troops. We were asked to sit within the circle and then I think a photograph and some things of Jason's, like a T-shirt or passed around. It helps when you have more people in circle because each person's got a different psychic ability. So all these combined builds up the whole picture. So we saw that the body had been loaded into a van and taken up towards the Brecon Beacons. We saw the body being left very unceremoniously, but there was a tree that had been, the branch of a tree had broke. Are we anywhere near where your body is? Jason showed us a Celtic cross. The unique thing about it was, is that he said there were three of these crosses. And she said, this is near the spot where he was put. I just keep saying it's so obvious. You're missing me. Near there, that's where his body was. South Wales, May 2001. The race to find the body of murder victim Jason Williams is on. Police detain two local men, Alan Sinfield and Richard Davis. Sinfield has pointed the finger at Davis, but he maintains his innocence. Whatever they say may be irrelevant. DCI Ken Isaac knows that without Jason's body, a murder conviction is practically impossible. It was important uh, for us to recover Jason's body uh, for two reasons, primarily uh, to, to prove the case uh, of murder. There's been very few convictions or murder convictions where a body hasn't been recovered. And secondly, uh, for, for the family, so they could have uh, closure on the case. At the same time, psychic Sue Evans has launched her own search. She claims that she is in touch with the spirit of Jason and he has given her clues that will lead to the location of his body. Where we were in terms of the jigsaw at this stage was that we had more pieces to put together to build the whole picture. We needed to know where the body might be to help find Jason. Jason's sister is convinced by Sue's powers and asks the police to use her supernatural skills. But in the UK, busy murder investigation teams often discount the work of psychics. While Sue and Julie embark on their own hunt for more clues, the police act upon Sinfield's admission that he helped Davis dispose of the body. Following uh, Richard Davis killing uh, Jason Williams, uh, they've wrapped his body up uh, in black plastic bags. And he and Sinfield went uh, on the Brecon Beacons uh, looking for a place uh, to dispose of Jason's uh, body. Assigned this near impossible task of finding Jason's body in over 500 square miles of moorland is search expert John Williams. The area is so big 
unless we had so, so some indication as to where Jason was, then we were literally clutching at straws. What the police have that Sue doesn't is the help of one of the men who dumped Jason's body. We drove quite a few hundred miles over the, couple, over the days I was with him. I can recall him saying that they drove onto a, a grass verge at some point. And on my left-hand side, I could see some uh, tire marks that were on the grass verge. I looked uh, further along the road from where the tire marks were, and I could see a white bag. Uh, on top of the bag, there was a stone. And uh, it, it just seemed strange. This was in the middle of nowhere. There was absolutely nothing about them. Why is a stone suddenly being put on top of a, a carrier bag? Sue's psychic investigation has already shown her Jason's body dumped on the Brecon beacons. Will her visions of Celtic crosses and a broken tree turn out to be meaningful? The first thing I saw at this point, uh, I could see that this area uh, was flattened. Uh, and that was quite, quite obvious. You could then see um, the tree trunk here. And uh, you could see that some bark had been was removed from the main sort of trunk area. It just looked as if somebody put their foot in it. I was, I was more than satisfied that this was a scene, more than satisfied. As Sue predicted, it seems that Jason has been dumped near a broken tree. Now police meticulously search for his body or further evidence. It was literally a shoulder to shoulder, slow time search from the roadway into where, where I felt Jason was, uh, was placed. We'd heard that they'd actually sealed off an area in Brecon and were, were uh, forensic teams were searching it. For 12 hours, police search experts painstakingly examine an area that is almost the size of a football pitch. Miraculously, they discover a human hair. He came up trumps because his hair was found interwoven with uh, grass and bracken. For that particular scene, to find his hair was fantastic. I think at that point we were hoping that it was... they would find him. The hair is sent off for DNA testing to secure a match with Jason. After 24 hours of searching, the police are forced to acknowledge the worst. There was no body. Um, we, I carried a cursory search, but there was no body. Um, it was quite frustrating, really, when um, they came away empty-handed. Amazingly, Sue's vision of the broken tree has turned out to be accurate, but somebody has been back to the site and Jason's body is gone. Without it, a murder conviction is a near impossible task for the police. Over the following months, the police scour the Brecon beacons using helicopters, dive teams and sniffer dogs, every method available to them, except the powers of a psychic. Julie believes that where the police have failed, Sue will succeed. I feel it's definitely near these three Celtic crosses. So we decided to go in the car and go up and have a look for ourselves to see if we could find any of these landmarks that Jason was showing us. As we were driving along, we rounded a corner and um, I spotted a church behind some high sort of conifer trees. And we found a Celtic cross. There was a Celtic cross there. And as we approached it, um, I noticed that I could just see a Celtic cross in the, um, in the grounds. And I said to say, there's one Celtic cross there. Julie turned on and said, look, behind. And there was two other Celtic crosses. So these were the three Celtic crosses we felt that Jason was showing us. The clues and the jigsaws were coming together, and we just had to trust that he'd guide us to him. In South Wales, Two very different investigations race to find the body of murder victim Jason Williams. The police search the Brecon beacons but find no corpse. Jason's sister Julie turns to psychic Sue Evans. She is certain that Jason will be found near the three Celtic crosses that they have discovered in an old Welsh churchyard. The fact that we actually found three Celtic crosses in one churchyard, which I think is quite unusual anyway. You could feel his spirit around you and you would feel a nice warmth. I thought about it and I really can't think how logically she could come up with as much accurate information as, as she has. Mm. I would never have known these were you. And I do feel that Jason did draw us towards these to show he's in this area. Sue is certain that Jason is nearby. Julie supplies the police with the psychic's vision, but they prefer not to act on information allegedly from beyond the grave. So I'm used to them being sceptical 
I'm used to not being acknowledged by some of them, even when what I've set out to do has happened. But I feel Julie did feel a lot of frustration because she'd be going there and saying, well, look, we're doing this, we're doing that, why aren't you helping? The police have the confession of Sinfield and strong evidence pointing towards Davis as the murderer. But without Jason's body, taking Davis to court is risky. A conviction secured without a body is virtually unprecedented. Uh, my understanding that there's uh, been less than a dozen convictions in British judicial history, or it was at that stage, for a conviction of murder without a body. So we were, we were mind mindful of that. The police meticulously piece together a package that aims to prove that Jason is dead even without his body. It includes vital information from the crime scene. We, we got an interpretation to the blood. There was a large pool of blood. So any, anyone uh, who would have lost that amount of blood would have been seriously ill at that particular time. So that, that helped to support the fact that Jason Williams didn't leave the scene that, that night. The hair discovered in the forest comes back with a DNA match with Jason. What Sinfield was saying all along seems to be true. Then detectives interview Davy's girlfriend, Jody Sinfield, and she confirms that he admits to stabbing Jason. The police decide to gamble on the skills of their forensic team, and in February 2002, Davis and Sinfield are put in front of a court of law. Sue's claims that she has spoken to the spirit world will also be put to the test. It was spooky, for want of a better word. Um, as I say, when certain things were coming up, you could actually feel the hairs on the back of your neck going up. Julie claims that Sue continued to provide her family with visions of the murder, including details of the part that Davis played, the nature of the attack, and how Jason's body was moved. Now this information corresponds with what Julie hears in court. They realized that a lot of the information that I'd given them was accurate, bang on. This proved that I was on the right track all the way through. Julie did go back to see the police and say, well, Sue had told us all this before it came out, and yet you still refused to, to let her in on this. The thorough police investigation leaves no room for doubt. Sinfield gets two years for perverting the course of justice. Richard Davis is found guilty of Jason Williams' murder and sentenced to life. He continues to appeal against this judgment. We were satisfied and pleased, obviously, with uh, the fact that we, we had done a third investigation. But, but my thoughts uh, are with the family of, of Jason Williams. It's over four years since the trial. Jason still has no grave. His grieving family can only pay their respects at a memorial near the site where he was originally dumped. Jason seems to have accepted things a, a, a lot better as the years have gone on. He seems to have a little bit more acceptance of what's happened to him, but the drive is just as strong. He still wants us to find his body. He's still around us, and he is only a thought away, and he pops into my mind quite often, quite regular. Sue is certain that Jason is near the Three Crosses, and with police help, she could find his body. But the controversy over the intervention of psychics and clairvoyance in criminal investigations remains. Well, I feel that psychics are another tool that the police can use. I would like to see every police headquarters having psychics on their books. It's nice to see Callum's dog is still here. Oh, yes, Callum's little dog. Because obviously oh, he has no grave to go to. No. It's a little present for his father. I think she's been psychic from a child. To her, that is normal. And she, I get the impression she can't understand why we find it so amazing. Because for her, it's fact. Sue's relationship with Jason has had a lasting effect on her. It proves that there's life after death. And it proves that your loved ones care for you after they've died, and that they still have emotions and feelings, even though they're dead. I will always keep looking for him, and I will always be there for him for as long as I can. November 1982, fear cloaks the serenity of a small town in New Jersey. Popular teenager Amy Hoffman has disappeared without a trace. The police can't say if she's alive or dead, but psychic Nancy Weber knows there's been a murder and fears the killer is on a rampage. He's killed before, he's killing again. 
It's going to kill more. She tells me something, I believe it to be gospel. Can Nancy help catch the killer before his brutality is unleashed again? Three people out for a pleasant afternoon stroll, or so it seems, a closer look, and it becomes apparent this is not a recreational time filler. These people are not so ordinary. The conversation underscores the seriousness of their purpose. She's screaming for her life and begging mercy. Right when not she was first the found, there was no evidence that would indicate... A Bill Hughes is a police officer, Nancy Weber is a professional psychic, and Jimmy Moore is retired. He was detective captain at the Parsippany Police Department. More than 20 years ago, the trio came together and stood in this secluded location. What happened here would change their lives forever. November 23, 1982. Amy Hoffman, an 18-year-old senior high school student, leaves her part-time job at a Morris County shopping mall. In the parking lot, she says goodnight to her friend. It's approximately 9.35 p.m. Two people see Amy as she walks across the back lot to where her car is parked. One, a fellow worker driving out of the parking lot. The other, her killer. Well, her vehicle was found in the parking lot, uh, not too far away from the store that she worked in. And the door was open on the car, and, and there was a witness. And she noticed a, a male, white male, uh, in a green Chevrolet that was parked a couple spots away from where Amy's car was. And he was just sitting there in the, in the car at that time. It's Thanksgiving, two days since Amy Hoffman was last seen alive. Morris County, New Jersey comprises several small townships. Police departments from across the region become involved in the search for Amy. It had a major impact on the community. Women were, were hesitant about going out on their own especially at night. 20 miles away in Mount Olive, Nancy Weber, who runs her own psychic practice, gets a phone call from a woman. She said, my daughter has a best friend who works at the Morris County Mall, and she's missing. She didn't come home. And that's when the vision popped up. The image I kept having was this naked body, multiple wounds all over. She was lying in water, raped. She had been terribly, terribly uh, violated before she was murdered. And so I just went right into saying to her, I am sorry, I really can't discuss this with you. You call Amy's parents or you call the police that are involved. That same day, Amy Hoffman's body was found in a retention tank at the reservoir in Randolph. There was a couple walking their dog through the woods, and it's, it's an isolated area. It's like a lover's lane area. And they came across the body floating in the water. There was numerous slashes and stab wounds to her body. And some were post-mortem, meaning that after she had died, the the assailant still continues to slash at her and, and cut her body. Uh, it was pretty gruesome. Nancy's vision of the dead young woman was accurate. Bill Hughes, a detective with the Mount Olive Police Department, happened to drop by Nancy's house. Most of the police officers in uh, Mount Olive Township knew Nancy because she was just a friend of a lot of guys on the force, her and her family. And I stopped by, uh, just stopped by Nancy's house um, just for a cup of coffee. By the way, I read the newspaper account of Amy Hoffman. Why are they lying? She was raped. She wasn't not sexually abused. She was mutilated, not no wounds obvious. The investigators at the time did not believe that sexual assault had, had occurred, uh, but Nancy said that it had, that uh, the girl had been sexually assaulted. 
there was no way of knowing because there was no physical evidence that you could see at the scene, according to the investigators, to indicate any type of sexual contact. Uh, what we found out later on was, yes, she indeed had been sexually assaulted uh, by the suspect, uh, and that was the result of forensics taken by the medical examiner's office. I didn't say anything to Bill about wanting to be involved at all. I, it's one of the things I don't ever do. I wait to be asked. When it comes to this kind of work, it's very important, I believe, for all concerned, including the victim, to know that I am the appropriate person to participate. It's an ingredient. I'm one of the ingredients or not. So I don't ask to help. Maybe to a lesser extent today, but at that time, psychics were certainly not taken seriously. They probably were looked at as people trying to make a name for themselves, people uh, that would take advantage of um, the weak. I was a small player in this investigation. I'm, I'm on the periphery, <laughs> so I really had no authority. I had to find somebody that was very open-minded, kind of like myself, you know, I, I'll try anything once, I you know, believe anything once until it's proven wrong. Detective Bill Hughes has faith in Nancy's psychic powers, and she has a real concern that the killer will strike again. He's killed before, he's killing again, he's going to kill more. November 1982, Morris County, New Jersey. 18-year-old student Amy Hoffman goes missing. Two days later, her mutilated body is discovered in a water retention tank. Police from all across the region are hunting down a brutal killer. On the same day Amy's body is discovered, psychic Nancy Weber has a vision of the crime scene. She knows that the young woman has been sexually assaulted and murdered even before police. Now she suspects the killer will strike again. She's right. The second victim was a girl named Deidre O'Brien who worked in a local restaurant and was heading home early in the morning. It was after midnight. She was forced off the road and abducted from her vehicle and later brought to a rest stop on Route 80 in Warren Township, where she was murdered. We were all very upset because now we had two gruesome homicides on our hands. And we had a feeling that the same individual was involved because the same type vehicle was seen leaving the scene of Deidre O'Brien's uh, homicide. A second woman dead in such a short time leaves little doubt that police are dealing with a serial killer. But this time, the killer leaves a calling card, tire prints. Detective Bill Hughes thinks it's crucial to get Nancy officially involved in the case. But he is just one of hundreds of police officers tracking down what they now suspect is a serial killer. He needs to get someone he can trust to hear her out. I knew that Jimmy Moore is a seasoned veteran. Jimmy has well over 20 years on the police force at the time. He's a captain. He's in charge of the detectives in Persephone. He's more directly involved in the case because Amy Hoffman is from Persephone. So I knew that if I could talk to Jim, then I might be able to get them to use Nancy uh, to, to do some investigative leads on the case or to give us some direction to go on the case. I had never used a psychic, and I was a little skeptical. I really didn't believe too, too much into them. Is it possible? I mean, can somebody truly do this? Uh, I, I actually had flashbacks of being on the boardwalk and down at the Jersey Shore, and you see these signs, palm readings, and, and of course, I don't believe in any of that. And so I was a little skeptical, but I said, you know what? We have nothing really to go with. Uh, if, it's, if there's a chance that it's going to solve the case, I'm willing to try it. When I opened the door to Bill at six foot five, standing next to this about five foot seven man who he introduces as Captain Jimmy Moore from Homicide, I thought, uh oh, <laughs> what now? And he simply asked me to repeat to Jimmy what I had told him about the newspaper account of Amy Hoffman and my belief that there was a discrepancy there. I asked Nancy some questions and stuff like that and pretty much got wanted to get to know her as an individual. And I found out that she was a just down-to-earth type of individual. And uh, she didn't seem to be a person that exaggerates or puts anything on. She, and I was impressed uh, by her personality. And, I said, how do you do this? And she just, I, I just see it. And she says, I don't know why or how, but I, I just see things. 
And she says, all I can do is tell you what I see. And she says, I don't want you to tell me anything about the case, and I don't want you to give me any leads. What we decided to do at that point was take a ride in my car. And what we were going to do is uh, take her, Nancy, by the, uh, the scenes, uh, the scenes of the abduction uh, and the scenes of the murder and the scenes where their bodies were left. When I was driving with Bill and Jimmy in the car the first day, when we went down a, a road, I could feel I was coming towards the end of her life. It was as if the energy of the road itself got darker and darker, got more magnetically charged with an energy that felt more panicky, heightened anxiety. The first place that we went to was the reservoir in Randolph. Uh, we took Nancy down there and parked the cars, and we let Nancy walk around. It was an eerie feeling. You know, it was a very isolated area, wooded area, no homes around, um, very macabre. You could almost feel uh, the horror that Amy would have gone through. Amy could have been dumped in any one of about 12 acres, and Nancy went right to the spot where Amy was left. I felt almost as if Amy was waiting for me there on the ground. So I got down on the ground on my knees, and I could feel no separation between the memory of what Amy went through and myself at that point. I began to speak words I believed were the last words where she was begging Please don't kill me. I believe she knew that that's what he was about by then. She had already been raped. She had already been badly cut. And I believe she understood that he was enjoying this. And she didn't know how to get through to him. She had no idea how to get through to this person who seemed bent on destroying her. For me, it was very important to stay with it because I'm looking for the tiniest bit uh, of a clue, a, a shred of evidence that might stop him. Went back in the car and kept reviewing. Now I'm going over all the film again and again, like an editor, attempting to be as detailed as possible. Pop. He's from Polish descent. He grew up in Morristown. Pop. He was in Florida. He was in jail there for murder. And I'm telling Jimmy and Bill as I get it, in the car, driving. They let him out. Early parole? Pop. His name kept coming to me, the man who was with her, James. I don't know if she knew his name. I knew I knew it. So when I got the last name beginning with a K and Kadababaich. I felt that Nancy was seeing what we were looking for. She had this individual pegged, and she was trying as hard as she could to give us as much evidence that we, that she could see to, to, uh, to, to arrest us, to arrest him, because she kept telling me, Jim says, this guy is sick, and he's just gonna keep killing until he's caught. And she was upset with that. She, she was very adamant about telling me that this was a sick individual, and he's just going to keep on killing. It wasn't a crime of passion. It wasn't he stalked this particular person for weeks and had an obsession with her. He had an obsession with joy at causing harm. When I saw that, I knew he's not going to stop until somebody stops him. This man will not stop. With two brutal murders occurring within 10 days, every available police officer in Morris County is on the case. Most are following procedure, the routine that is police work. Two are following a totally different line of inquiry. Detectives Jimmy Moore and Bill Hughes have teamed up with psychic Nancy Weber in their own private investigation. They've been able to get quite a bit of information from Nancy about the first murder. Now they want to know what she can tell them about the second. After the Deidre O'Brien homicide, I picked up Nancy and we, we drove to the rest area where the crime had taken place. 
she took us right to the spot where the where the suspect had parked uh, with Deidre. Uh, she described the encounter there. And I see this truck in my mind. And I see a trucker and I see this woman uh, coming out of a speeding car. She's naked. She's knifed. And I'm looking at the car and I'm looking at her. It's the same car. It's James. I know it. The only thing that stopped him from continuing with his attempt to sexually assault her was the fact that there was a truck parked in the rest area a little ahead of them. Nancy felt that the assailant had just had enough and didn't want to be bothered with her anymore, so he stabbed her and threw her out of the car and then drove her off. And that's when Deidre had enough strength to pick herself up and, and go to the truck to uh, knock on the door, to, uh, getting help from the truck driver. The truck driver got on the CB radio and radioed for help, and troopers eventually got there, but uh, uh, unfortunately, Deidre passed away in the arms of the truck driver. I was impressed with Nancy when I took her to the truck stop because everything that she was telling me was exactly what had happened, as much as we knew, from the evidence and from the truck driver's uh, statement. She's telling us stuff that there's no way Nancy could have known, because this is, you know, in the investigative files. This is not stuff that's being released to the press. And yet, Nancy knows what happened. Over the next few days, Nancy keeps replaying the visions over in her head. Every time I would go back to James, I would get another tiny little piece. He was at least about 5'10", slim, very narrow, thin, long nose, dark eyes. And I'd spend hours on it. I would be reviewing it, kind of like 18-hour days of review editing. Then I'd go back some more, and I'd feel the car, his brother, gas station. Brother owns it, works it. That's where he got the car, from his brother, at a gas station. They're local. They're Wharton, they're Morristown, they're local. They all know who he is. Everybody knows who he is. They'll know his last name. He was a local terror, growing up even. The cops all know who he is. He's not an unfamiliar character. This guy was dangerous when he was in high school. Nancy's coming up with all this stuff that she couldn't have possibly known about, and she's given us all this good information. Uh, and then a little bit of frustration sets in because you, you believe what she's saying, and now you're trying to think to yourself, how am I going to convince the bosses in Morris County to listen to what she has to say? At this stage, the detectives want permission from the county prosecutor to officially involve Nancy in the investigation, but before they can present their case, they are denied access to his office. The prosecutor is not interested. As Nancy and I started to walk through the door, a detective from the prosecutor's office stopped me, and who knew me personally, and he said, Jim, what's she doing here? I said, well, she's been with us and given us information on the, on the case. And he said, well, the prosecutor doesn't want her here. He doesn't want to get involved with her. I was upset with the prosecutor for not even hearing us out. I felt that he should have at least listened to what we had to say, and it bothered me. It, it, to this day, it bothers me why he did that. The headlines were all over not only our state, but the nation and all, all the news, that we had a serial killer. Nobody knew who it was. They couldn't figure it out. Nancy is also upset and frustrated. She decides to appeal to a higher authority. She calls some students who she trusts, and they form a psychic circle. Together, they use psychic prayer to try and stop the killer in his tracks. Went through everything. And when I was finished, I told them, join hands with me. So we went to the light, went to the Godhead, went to the apex, and through that, asked that if it was in the spiritual path of all concerned, to bring back to James K. Papa Itch the pain he has given and the suffering he has caused, let him feel it now. Let him get it in such a manner he can no longer give it. And I simply held on to that thought the rest of the night. It was my mantra. It was my chant. It is his time. Let him feel his own pain. He cannot give it out any longer. Let him feel his own pain. He cannot give it out any longer. It is over. 
power of divine intervention has been argued and disputed since time began. Can a New Jersey psychic's prayer really stop the killer in his tracks? In fact, there's been a dramatic break in the case overnight. I get a call home and I was told that an individual was arrested uh, in response to the Amy Hoffman, Deidre O'Brien murders. They responded to a home in Morristown where an individual had been stabbed. While they were at the scene, one of the officers noticed the green Chevrolet sitting in the driveway, and it matched the description of the vehicle we were looking for. So they called for the forensic team to come to the uh, scene to uh, check this vehicle out. As it turned out, they, they found the tire on the car matched the imprint that was found at uh, Deidre O'Brien's abduction. And subsequently, the individual was arrested and charged with the two homicides. When I found out who the individual was and his background, I couldn't believe how accurate Nancy's information was that she had given us. So we have our guy under arrest, James Kodadich. Um, and what we find out about James is very interesting. A lot of the stuff that Nancy had told us was right on the money. James Kodadich had a brother who was a mechanic, had lived pretty much his entire life in, in Morris County. James had moved to Florida, had been in prison in Florida, and that he'd murdered while he was in prison in Florida, stuff that Nancy had come up with. His last name was Kodadich, the K and the I-T-C-H that Nancy had come up with. Early in the morning, I get a call from Jimmy, and he goes, hey, Nancy, what did you do? I said, what do you mean, what did I do? He said, what did you do? I said, I had class last night. And I told them about it. And we said a prayer to finish it. Make this man have all the pain he gave to women. He said, well, James Kadadich. And as he said the words in the name, it was like, boom, 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 lights go on. I went, that's him. All the information that she saw, that she gave us, was exactly the truth. I think that a lot of people have to see for themselves. You know, there's going to be people that are going to watch this episode and they're going to see me and they're going to listen to me talk, they're going to listen to Jimmy Moore talk, they're going to listen to different people talking about their experiences with psychics, and they're just not going to buy it. And so be it. Um, but if you're a police officer and you don't buy it, then you probably shouldn't be in the investigative side of anything. I says, because like, like I said before, you've got to keep an open mind. You've got to be willing to try anything. If you try it and you don't like it and it doesn't work out for you, so be it. Then don't try it again if you don't want to, but at least try it once. But there is still a mystery surrounding the event of James Kodadich's arrest. Police arrived at his house after he called them complaining he'd been stabbed. Could Nancy's prayer have anything to do with this? He claimed that a dark-haired woman ran him off the road and knifed him in the back. And at the time, my hair wasn't gray, and it was longish. And I thought, I wonder if he'd recognize me if he met me. I'd love it. I'd love him to know that, you know, you stand there with all the victims. And that victims have power, you fool. How could you do this? It's up to you to decide whether she had anything to do with it or not. On October 29th, 1984, James Kodadich became the first man sentenced to die under New Jersey's revised capital punishment statute. The sentence was later commuted to life imprisonment. After his arrest, it was determined that Kodadich had actually stabbed himself. He never explained why, although the self-inflicted wounds were not life-threatening, and apparently he never again spoke of the long-haired woman he claimed had attacked him. But perhaps he sees her now and then. December 1984, Kumru Township, Pennsylvania. The body of a strangled woman is dumped in a ravine. For 20 years, the case of Jane Doe lies dormant until a cop and a psychic join forces. I started to see the lines of light across a map, and I saw the Brooklyn Bridge. Can a psychic's map locate a killer and solve a 20-year-old murder?
Cumru, a small township in rural Pennsylvania. The solving of the Jane Doe case began in an unorthodox way, with an inquiry into the unrelated homicide of a local man. Murder is an unusual occurrence in this community. More unusual is the fact Detective Robert Warner, for the first time in his career, is going to meet with professional psychic Lauren Thibodeau. She has been working with the dead man's family. That's why Warner is here, hoping to find some answers. I figured I'll use every tool I can to solve a crime. And at this point here, I figured I had nothing to lose. So let's go down and talk to Dr. Lauren and see. Despite his optimism, Warner is not about to go advertising the visit just yet. At that time, I didn't know how people would react, so I kept it to myself. In fact, he didn't even tell Lauren his reason for the visit. I didn't say anything about that case when I first walked in. She didn't even know I was a police officer. Um, I walked in and sat down, and she knew I was there for a reading. And actually, Dr. Lauren said, asked me if I was in law enforcement and if I was a police officer, and I said yes. As Warner hadn't identified himself, there's no way Lauren could have known he was a cop. That's when she said, well, you're working on two cases, and one of them's very old like put on a shelf for many years. And I was only working on one at the time. So uh, I first said, no, I only have one case. I said, no, there's two cold cases here, too. And he said something like, well, I only have this one, but keep talking. So, so I did. This lady's crazy. <laughs> I'm here for one I can't stop. <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, at first it was like, no, no way, you know, but. When you hear something like that, it's always on your mind now for the rest of the reading. You're picking your brain trying to figure out, oh, what is she talking about? What is she talking about? And then I remembered this other case that we had that I wasn't even working on. And I told her I wasn't working on that, but um, she said that that's going to be being worked on. She sees that, she sees, actually saw that one being solved. So at that point there, uh, it, I was excited. The second case that Lauren referred to was an unsolved homicide dating back to 1984. That year, as residents of the small community of Kumru Township prepared for the holidays, a body was dumped on the outskirts of town. Discovered two days before Christmas, the victim had been strangled and meticulously bound with rope. She was wrapped in a green army-style blanket and wrapped again in a paint-splattered drop cloth. An autopsy revealed that the woman was about 30 years old and had a history of abusing drugs. Forensic investigation, which was still in its infancy, revealed no clues to the killer's identity. With no means of identification, the victim was referred to as Jane Doe, a standard police procedure in the US. She was buried in a local cemetery. At the time Jane Doe was murdered, Lauren was a young woman at college living in a different state Warner was blown away by the fact that Lauren had any inclination about the case. She's talking about the two cases that we have, which floored me. For her to even say that, how does she know that we have two cases? Um, and one's been sitting on a shelf for 15 or 20 years. And that's when I contacted her the following day. It was in that phone conversation that I started seeing green little lights traveling across Route 78, it was as if I was looking at a map of New Jersey, New York, and Eastern Pennsylvania. And as it moved across, I looked upward, sort of upward toward the Brooklyn Bridge. And I, I could feel, you know, and even smell the, the energy of the city and, and that we were dealing with, you know, New York. Lauren was not only able to give a sense of place, she was also able to give some clue as to the killer's occupation. And I remember asking Detective Rob if the, one of the people that they thought it might have been could have been a truck driver, because I was shown that this was somebody who would have... I kept seeing the side of a cab of a truck. So at this point here, I, I thanked her and left to go with that. I still did not have the case. A few months later, my sergeant had pulled the case out and put it over on my desk and told me, you know, since you're going to be here a while, you might as well start working on this and, and see what you can do with it. Two months after Lauren predicted it, 
Warner was assigned the Jane Doe case. The other case, the murder he went to see Lauren about in the first place, remained unsolved. But for now, Warner focused on the unidentified woman's case. Lauren had also envisioned a truck driver, and sure enough, one of the prime suspects in the original investigation was indeed a truck driver. Back in 84, there was a truck driver that was going around, uh, p picking up young ladies with reddish brown hair, strangling them, and dumping them out of his truck. After they were able to capture the truck driver, he admitted to all the ones that he did. He said he was not in Pennsylvania. There was no way of proving he was in Pennsylvania. Uh, so we knew it wasn't him. Uh, the actual ligatures were tied differently. Uh, at that time, there was no connection. Did Lauren get it wrong? Was her vision of the truck driver the man who had already been cleared in the case? Or was she right? Was the woman's murderer simply a different truck driver? And the big question, where was the killer right now? Cold cases are notoriously problematic. Memories fade, evidence becomes contaminated, witnesses die. You gotta understand, when the first time that this information came up, I didn't even know Jane Doe's name. Without the victim's name, there was virtually no chance of ever nailing the killer. But there was one positive to working a 20-year-old crime. Forensics technology had come a long way in the last decade. When Detective Robert Warner started investigating a local murder in Cumru Township, Pennsylvania, he never expected to be hurled back 20 years to an unsolved homicide. Okay. Professional psychic Lauren Thibodeau predicted that Warner would be working on an old, unsolved case. Now he was. The case of Jane Doe, a woman who had been strangled, tied up in a blanket, and dumped over an embankment. Basically what it was was it, it got it fired up in me. Um, and I think my sergeant, when I came back and told him after the reading I had the first time with, with Lauren um, about the two cases and so forth, I think it kind of all just went together. Lauren's vision of the Brooklyn Bridge clearly indicated a New York connection to the case. There was also the map highlighting Route 78, and she sensed that the murderer was a truck driver. As to how psychics see visions, they're all different. Many people see it visually, others perceive it in a telepathic, auditory way. Others get a real gut sense, you know, they literally have a gut clench. Many people have what I call sort of a field feeling, like from the skin out. They have, you know, the tingles or something. So there are at least four different ways people perceive it. Warner's first challenge was to put a name to the victim. The 1984 autopsy had revealed that the woman was a drug addict. 20 years on, could this help the police find her real identity? Warner reckoned there was a reasonable chance that she had a criminal record. If that was the case, her fingerprints would be on file. APHIS is the national database of all criminal fingerprints. It didn't exist when the woman was murdered in 1984. Warner submitted her fingerprints, and sure enough, she had been arrested on a minor drug offense. Match gave me Margaret Calciano and Margaret Gravasi. Gravasi was, was Margie's married name. She was married for about a year in the 70s. So with those two names at that point, I have a computer system where I can go in and I can type in the names in the certain states. And I typed in Brooklyn, New York, and typed in her married name, and I didn't come up with anything. I come up with a few Gravasis. I tried calling, and no one knew Margie at that point. So then I took her maiden name, which was Calciano, entered that in to my system, and came up with probably 250 names in Brooklyn. And the first name I called was her mother. He says, uh... Do you have a daughter named Margaret? I says, yes. I says, who's calling? And he says, I'm a detective from Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and um, he says, I hate to tell you this, Miss Calciano, but we found your daughter in 1984. And I says, okay. I says, what do you mean found her? He says, well, she was murdered. 
For 20 long years, Joan Calciano lived the fear and dread only a mother can comprehend. The sheer horror of never knowing if her daughter was alive or dead. Now, finally, the wait was over. It was a relief because at least I knew, you know, in my, I knew in my heart she wasn't alive, but I didn't know where she was. You know, and a lot of things go through a mother's mind, you know, and I just thank God she was cut up and never been found and or buried and never been found. And, you know, just so many things went through my mind, but uh, I miss her, you know. She was such a beautiful girl. She could have had anything in life. Yeah, but that was it. Here's a woman who lost her, lost her daughter 20 years ago, and she said the last time she saw her was December 19th, 1984, and she got into an argument with her, slapped her on the face, and she ran out the door, and that was the last she saw her. And it haunted her ever since that that was the way her and her daughter split. The next day, Warner and his partner drove to Mrs. Calciano's apartment in Brooklyn. She welcomed us in, and there were friends and family members there. We sat around the kitchen table, and we showed her photos just to make sure that she could ID and say that, yes, that's my daughter. We showed her photos from the autopsy. You know, and we had to ID it, and it was her. And uh, it was hard, you know, to identify her. And then we got down to brass tacks, and we asked them who was involved in this. He asked me if I had any idea who killed her, and I said yes. And I gave him the guy's name. With this information, could Warner find the killer? For almost 20 years, the file on an unidentified female murder victim lay dormant. The Kumru Township Police Department had reached a dead end until Detective Robert Warner met with professional psychic Lauren Thibodeau. Spurred on by Lauren's visions, and with some good old-fashioned police work, Warner was able to identify the woman as Margie Calciano. Margie's family were able to identify who they thought was her killer. All of them said without a doubt, Peter, and they gave us the last name of Iosa. Uh, Peter was last seen with her, he was, from what the family at that time had told us, he was fatally attracted to her. He would get upset if she was with someone else. Um, he was quite older than her. He was 20 years her senior. He was obsessed with my daughter, and uh, I knew that he had killed her because he disappeared the same day she did, and that was December 19th. He supposedly was a very hothead. Uh, he would snap, and, and, and he slapped her around before. She was doing coke, and uh, he was giving her money to buy it. And when she needed money, you know, he gave it to her. And he swore nobody would ever have her, you know, and he made sure of that. Yeah. So we kind of had a good feeling that this was, a, he was a good, good suspect. Um, when we left, uh, we just didn't know how to find him. Uh, we returned back to our station the following day, and um, I started working on it, and I couldn't find the last name of Peter Iosa anywhere in New York. Uh, I couldn't find it anywhere in the United States. According to the Census Bureau, there are 555,864 Peters living in the United States. All Warner has to do is find the right one, and all he has to go on are Lauren's visions a truck, the map with the beam of light, and the Brooklyn Bridge. Warner calls Lauren. I remember talking to him by telephone not long after about this situation and getting that very visual movie feeling. As he was describing things that he knew about this case, I, I began to see imagery of a truck driver. Not a big guy, this one. I didn't get a sense of big hulking. On the slender side, definitely a smoker. And I remember seeing the white door of a truck opening, and as if I was looking over the shoulder of the driver stepping out. A, a thickly quilted uh, sort of plaid uh, 
like a flannel, thick flannel shirt that you might wear instead of a coat in, in wintertime. Definitely felt like winter to me. I it was very clear that we were at a crisp, cool, um, almost like could smell lake water near it. And we were at a truck stop somewhere near water. And I guess in this case, it would have been the Great Lakes. That region would be on the way. It's almost like a psychic profile of him. I do feel he's a, a repeat killer. Certainly um, a lot of sexual violence. Yeah, rape, assault, that sort of thing. The revelation that this might be the work of a serial killer as opposed to a one-off crime of passion upped the ante for Warner. He was now in a race against time. We have to get him. We need to get him off the street. If he's killed once and he's going to do it again, and how many has he done in between? Um, it's like any law enforcement officer, anyone actually, that, you know, you want to get this guy off the road, off the streets. He's, he's a danger. Um, there's not a female around that's safe as long as he's out there. In an attempt to get Pete's last name, Warner phoned Joe Dresick, an ex-boyfriend of Margie. And he said that he didn't know the name, but he knew that Pete had filed a complaint against him one time, and that the police may have it on record if they'll find it from way back then. So at that time, I contacted uh, New York PD, gave them the information that I had, and they were able to come up with a report and faxed it to me in a couple of days, and it came back with Peter Williams. Wanner used Williams' social security number to track the fugitive. He discovered Williams was drawing welfare checks in Milwaukee, and he had been a truck driver, just as Lauren had predicted. One of his main routes had been Brooklyn to Wisconsin, which would have taken him past the Great Lakes. Once again, Lauren's visions proved to be uncannily accurate. With Lauren's help, Warner has gotten this far. He has a name, Peter Williams, and a face. But has he got the hard evidence needed to convict the man he believes murdered Margie Calciano? At any given time, there's well over 20,000 women missing in the US. Margie Calciano was just another statistic. And for 20 years, she didn't even have a name. Were it not for the collaboration of Detective Robert Warner and professional psychic Lauren Thibodeau, the chances are Margie would have faded into history as an unidentified victim. The combination of psychic intervention and solid conventional police work produced a prime suspect, Peter Williams. When I first met Pete and I walked up to him, I advised him who I was and the reason why I went to talk to him, and the blood drained from his face. You could see him just literally turn white. He was just pale, and it became quite nervous. He said the last time he saw Margaret took her to a methadone clinic, and she got out of the car, and that was the last he saw her, and he said he washed his hands of her. And those words, when he said, I washed my hands of her, made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Um, he. Uh, he said he didn't deny it being intimate with her, but what he did deny was killing her. Warner needed more than suspicion to nail Williams. He needed hard evidence, and he had it. When he took on the case, all the evidence was resubmitted back to the lab. Improved forensics technology revealed a single hair embedded in the army blanket used to wrap Margie. To prove it belonged to Williams, he needed to get a DNA sample. He felt like he had that licked because he wasn't denying having sex with her. What he was denying was killing her. So he was willing to give us the DNA samples. He didn't know we had the hair at that, at that point. And after the fact, when we, well, prior to leaving, I basically had told him flat out that we felt he's the one that did this. We knew that he probably wouldn't stay in Milwaukee long, and he didn't. He left a few weeks after we were there. The DNA analysis proved positive. The single hair embedded in the blanket that encased Margie Calciano matched the DNA sample taken from Williams. When we arrested him in Tucson, uh, he looked at it. He didn't say a whole lot. He didn't say he wasn't, wasn't guilty at that point. Um, what he said was, um, he read the probable cause and saw the hair. 
And I think that's what floored him. I think he realized that he, he had it at that point. The DNA profile of the hair recovered from the green blanket matched the DNA profile of Peter Williams. <laughs> Based on your affiant's investigation, information that your affiant has received in the DNA profile results which were received from mitotyping technologies matching the recovered hair from the green blanket wrapped around the victim and the DNA profile of Peter Williams, I am requesting an arrest warrant be issued for the suspect, Peter Williams. You know what you have to do, right? A couple of mistakes. Peter Williams was charged with first-degree murder and taken back to Pennsylvania. A month before he was due to face trial, Williams died of cancer. Once again, he had cheated the scales of justice. I wish we could have gone to trial because I, I would have rather him been found guilty by a jury. It would have been better for the family and friends that way. It would have been a definite closure. I felt I was cheated. Um, when he killed her, and not knowing where she was, all those years. And then I wanted to see his face in the courtroom. I wanted him to see me, and which I felt like I got cheated again, you know? And it was hard. I mean, I, I felt very bad. I broke down and cried because I didn't want it to go that way. I wanted him to see me, but it didn't work. So naturally, I felt I was cheated again, you know? When Margie Calciano had been positively identified, at the request of her mother, her body was exhumed. Today, she is buried in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, just blocks from her mom's home. And it was funny because when we were up in Brooklyn, we're sitting and I'm looking at the Brooklyn Bridge and that's when it dawned on me and I started thinking about all the things that Dr. Lauren told me that fit. Even though prior to that, I didn't, it didn't sink in and I, I wasn't using it. But after I sat there and thought about it, I thought, okay, the Brooklyn Bridge, I just went down the line and all the pieces started fitting in. I think where people get stuck is that it's psychic and it must be somehow bigger or more magical than something else, and it's not. It's just a different way of getting information. You'll get bits and pieces of information. It's all fragmented. And what you have to do is, it's like a puzzle. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. And you have to sit down and try and place these things into your case. Uh, once you sit down and you can pop in all the pieces, you'll solve your crime. I would say the best attitude for success is one of very practical, if this can help me solve a case, I'll use it, right? It should be seen as a tool, not as a solution to a case. Psychics do not solve the crimes. The police do that. Where we have a help, I think, is sorting out the wheat from the chaff. Would we have solved the case if I didn't go to Dr. Lauren? Um, it's kind of strange how things work. It's like it's meant to be, you know? It's like things happen for a reason. Every suspect is innocent until proven guilty. Because Williams died before going to trial, nobody can say for certain if Peter Williams killed Margie Calciano. And there's another twist to the story. Again, because there was no trial, authorities are not allowed to submit Williams' DNA to the national database. So other police officers trying to solve other cold cases will never be able to cross-check Williams as a suspect. So we may never know for certain if and how many times he killed. School's out and 14-year-old Rachel Domus is running late. She misses her bus and starts the three-mile walk home. She never makes it. Although there's no evidence of foul play, the pressure is on Detective Gary Miko to find the girl quickly. Didn't have a crime. Uh, we didn't have a victim. We didn't have evidence of, of, of anything. But psychic Nancy Weber claims to see a crime unfolding. I know he's the killer. Can the rookie cop and the seasoned psychic team up to find the missing girl? Long Valley, New Jersey, the sort of place where no one locks their doors, a safe place to raise a family. So when 14-year-old Rachel Domus misses her school bus and doesn't return home, police don't immediately fear the worst. 
Her parents have called the police to report her missing, but the most likely explanation, Rachel is just out with her friends and has forgotten to check in with her parents. Phone rings, and it was the uh, vice principal of the high school, who I had a rapport with, who I knew quite well, um, asked me what, what we were doing about the missing girl. I believe two or three of her girlfriends were in his office at the time and were encouraging him to, to give us a call to, to try and find out what happened because they knew her and she, she wasn't that type of a girl. The call from the principal disturbs Miko. He goes straight to Rachel's home to meet with her parents. You had the immediate sense that something was wrong. The parents know their children well and they're telling you something's wrong and something's wrong. I remember seeing a photo of her on a wall. I recognized the face. The previous year, she was in grade school, and she walked to school, and we had a school post where we crossed kids in the morning and then crossed them again in the afternoon. So there's a, a definite human factor that comes into play, and also just knowing her personality as little as I did, I couldn't imagine her as a person who would run away from home. Walked into her bedroom, looked for any kind of luggage missing, clothing missing, a note, any sign of her running away. And everything was intact. The only thing missing were the clothes that she wore to school that day and her books. Across town, psychic Nancy Weber's phone rings. It's a friend of the missing girl's family, and the woman is frantic. Oh, my God. This girl, Rachel, who lived down the lives down the block from us, hasn't come home from school. She's missing. I'm listening to this voice. And as I listen to the voice, images start flashing before me. I, I hear the scuffling, and I know it's leaves, and I know it, the smell of it is woods. I hear his voice. I see his eye wandering. I don't see his whole face. It's the smell of him, it's the smell of autos and gasoline and Everything moves very quickly, like rushing torrents of film, and, and that's why I have to go back over it and slow it down. Nancy envisions a young woman, but she's not sure if it's the missing teenager. And what can I do to confirm the image I have? Because I had an image of a girl, a photo. So I said to her, listen, uh, do you have a photo of her? I can get her yearbook. Okay, so I'll put the woman to work and I'll be able to see if the photo matches what I see in my mind. Meanwhile, Detective Miko is totally unaware of Nancy's visions. All he knows is a girl has gone missing, and yet somebody somewhere must have seen her. What I needed to do was try and find someone that saw her. If she missed the bus and she was walking, let's try and track down some witnesses that saw this person, our, our missing person, walking um, from the high school that few mile walk to her home. And that was my goal. Rachel's route home would have taken her past a busy service station. Miko heads straight there. Most people aren't home during the week, during the day. Um, so let's start with someone that you know is up and down the street on a pretty consistent basis. And what I came up with was um, the owner of the station and several employees telling me they saw a vehicle, a green Volvo, parked up a hill uh, off of Fairview Avenue, just off the roadway into the woods just slightly. And it was there for several hours during the course of the day. They recognized the vehicle as uh, belonging to a former employee of the gas station, uh, Michael Manfredonia. And uh, he actually walked into the station that day claiming his car broke down and needed some help. Maybe he saw her, maybe he drove past her. Maybe he was a witness. That's, that was my, my hope, that he saw her. I, I found out that he lived in Chester Township, the next town over and I rang up the detective there to get a little background on Michael. And he called me back and said that he was arrested for, I believe, receiving stolen property. I asked for Michael's address um, and wanted to stop by and visit him. He supplied that information. I hung up the phone. I was getting ready to go, and the detective called back from Chester Township, telling me that Michael was in their headquarters um, at the moment, just walked in and was checking on the status of his community service. Miko is feeling lucky. He's got his first solid lead. He brings Manfredonia in for questioning. It's only been three hours since Miko was first assigned to the case. 
A gut instinct tells him that the man he's talking to might be somehow involved with the disappearance of Rachel Dolas. He wrote an incredibly detailed statement, almost covering each minute that he was there. He tells me his vehicle breaks down. He's able to back it up a hill off the roadway, walk around for two or three hours, got back at his vehicle, started it, and drove home. How does that happen? How does that happen? And I, I asked if he had possibly saw this girl walking at any point in time, and he, he told me no, he, he didn't think so. I remember asking, are you sure with all that walking around that you did, you didn't see her anywhere? You didn't pass her? You didn't, when you were you know, near your vehicle, when you were walking on Fairview Avenue? Because I understand she missed the bus, and, and you didn't pass by her? And the answer was no. Miko calls in another detective for help, George Duker. I was in a meeting, and he said, I need your help now. I need you right now. And he had some bad feelings about this missing person case, and came, I came to headquarters, he briefed me, and ultimately I had those same bad feelings. 20 miles away, Nancy Weber is about to have her worst suspicions confirmed by the friend of Rachel's family who had originally contacted her. There's a knock on my door. The woman comes in. She has a yearbook in her hand. She opens to the photo of Rachel. And I look at it. I instantly know it's confirmed that the images I have, for me, match it. Nancy is certain the girl is dead. Now she needs to convince police she can help. Every cop knows the first 48 hours in a missing person's case are critical. Evidence is still fresh, people's recollection of events still intact. It's been less than 10 hours since 14-year-old Rachel Domas was last seen at her high school. Detective Gary Miko might have a witness, but there's no evidence of foul play. Nobody even knows if the girl is alive or dead. At the exact same time, psychic Nancy Weber has a clear and terrifying vision of the girl's plight. And the image was a sequence of his grabbing her and repeatedly, I think, raping her. But along with the vision, the name Michael. Weber has no way of knowing that the police have a man named Michael in custody but she has no doubt that she has been a psychic witness to a monstrous crime. She wastes no time contacting authorities. She calls the one police officer she knows she can trust. And I call Ross English, who was chief of detectives at Mount Olive at the time, and I worked with him on a lot of cases. I said, hey, Ross, I just got some woman who came to me who showed me a photo of Rachel Domas in Long Valley. She's been missing since yesterday, I think. She's, she's in the woods. He said, let me make some calls, I'll be back. I'm praying I'm wrong and that Rachel shows up somehow. Back in Long Valley, detectives Gary Miko and George Duker are still questioning Michael Manfredonia. He's being very polite and says he wants to help, but the detectives feel certain he's hiding something. George was a little more direct with him on trying to be clear. We just weren't buying it up front. He, he was talking about how his car had broke down and, you know, he had worked nearby in the area, and he took a walk toward Norite Road. Just none of it really made sense. And at the same time as he's speaking, we're thinking about her possible actions as she left school that day. And the time frame and all of that just truly had us believing that, that this individual was involved. And finally, he said, Michael said, I want a lawyer. Officers have been sent to search his home and car, but they turn up nothing. In the middle of it all, Gary Miko gets a call from Ross English. He tells him Nancy Weber's horrific story. It was sort of like, yeah, okay, uh, Ross, I'll give her a call, and I believe I put the note in my pocket. And at some point in time, I would give this person a call. Um, again, I believe my job at that point was just to track down people that could have seen her, witnesses. So I didn't call this psychic back right away. Even if Gary had called Nancy right away, there was no way they could hold Michael Manfredonia any longer. And it was so frustrating because here we had a suspect that we truly believed was responsible for something we didn't even know yet, certainly nothing good, but we didn't have her. Then the real kicker, the detectives are given an ultimatum by their boss, charge Michael Manfredonia or let him go. 12, 14 hours after he was initially 
um, picked up. We were directed to release him and take him home. It's 3 a.m. Miko and Duker reluctantly drive Manfredonia home. They're both certain they're making a big mistake. Gary and I got in the car and we drove him home and we dropped him off and we just had such bad feelings about dropping him off and we didn't want to let it go. And uh, there's an abandoned railroad bed that runs parallel to Fairview Avenue and George and I in an unmarked patrol car at 4 a.m. still drove slowly down this railroad bed just looking for any sign, any evidence of a crime, maybe our victim walking, anything. We just, we didn't want to let it go. And that was, that was the last thing we did that, that day, that long day. Friday morning, 8 a.m., 17 hours since Rachel Domas was reported missing. Gary Miko remembers the note about the psychic. He gives her a call. I have a completely open mind. If a psychic has something to offer, I've got an ear. Finally, I could say something. I needed somebody to say something to. She said to me, I'm going to tell you something that I didn't tell the family, and I wouldn't do that. She's dead. And a boy named Michael did it. Miko is stunned. He and Duker had a man named Michael in for questioning for hours. If Nancy is right, he had almost certainly released the girl's killer the night before and given him a ride home. How did, how did she know that? How did she, how did she get that? No one knew that we had a Michael in custody. Gary appeared uh, uh, over the phone to be, I need, I need this, I need more, give me more. Uh, and at the same time I heard this groan of, oh, we had him for hours here, we were questioning him. But so far, the police haven't any evidence that there's been a crime, yet Nancy claims to have seen it take place. I am watching in-sequence event of someone, male, exploding all at once. I felt like this is somebody who had contained most of his rage to a degree, and then just blew it all at once. At the same time that Miko is talking to Weber, George Duker is leading a team, scouring the area where Michael's car was last seen. I got a radio transmission from one of the search teams telling me that they just found her pocketbook in the woods. I immediately raced from where I was to where they were and had entered into the woods. I get out of my police car. I'm running now in the woods toward the search team. They call me back again. We just found one of her shoes. I'm thinking at this point, this is tremendous. She was, she came home from school late. She, for whatever reason, was in the woods. She tripped, she fell, she broke her leg. She couldn't get up, she couldn't get help. And then I go to the crime scene and they're just, they're all standing there in, in just disbelief, looking at how he had partially buried her body. What he had done to her, the trauma of that homicide, was just, was just unbelievable. I was awoken by a phone call from one of our officers who was um, upset. We had, they had found her body. Um, they had found her buried, partially buried in a, uh, in a, a hole, like a big ditch, and uh, partially covered. And uh, I was on my way in. I dismissed everybody, and I sat with her body, her and I, for about an hour and a half, while we got forensic people on site, and we brought them in closer and closer. On the way, checking every rock, twig, stone, branch, anything we could that might be of evidential value. You arrive at the scene, and, and now you're, what you're hoping you wouldn't have to see, you have to see. What you're hoping you wouldn't have to deal with, you have to deal with. With the incredible accuracy of Nancy's visions in his mind, Miko knew immediately what he had to do. Now you're, you, you need to put a case together at this point in time. You need to find your suspect. Michael's your suspect. Michael's the only person so far that was put there. We knew we then had to find him again. So it was all there. It was all there. Gary Miko and George Duker rush to the Manfredonia home but he is not there. His parents tell them that earlier in the day, he had walked back into the heavily wooded mountainous area behind the home, 
but no one had seen him since. The detectives are devastated. 24 hours ago, they had a criminal, but no crime. Now they have a crime, but no criminal. I, I don't know why he, he decided to just take a walk. There was no press involved in terms of her body being located. Once again, police assemble search teams, but this time they are looking for prime suspect Michael Manfredonia. We had dogs, tracking dogs involved, and uh, we were unsuccessful that, that day. I believe it was Saturday, and, and didn't locate him at all on Saturday or any sign of him. Miko replays the conversation with Nancy Weber earlier that day. She'd said the killer smelled like oil and gasoline, and that fits. Manfredonia worked in a gas station. She knew his name was Michael, and long before police had the evidence, Nancy Weber knew that Rachel was dead. Could she also hold the key to where the killer was hiding out? And she had said to me, you know, just, just bring me something that he touched, that he handled some personal belonging. And, um, you know, maybe that would help me, you know, tell you where he is. I could not tell him where Michael was. I needed to make the contact with a person who had connections with Michael. And through that link, I can travel. Before Detective Miko could officially meet with Weber, he needed permission from the county prosecutor. You know, we never used a psychic before on anything. So this would have been a first. And clearly with a major case, you needed to get approval from at least our prosecutor's office uh, before any of that interaction could happen. Sometimes when I work with law enforcement, I know that I work far better with them than I work with some of the families and that I get far more results when I work with law enforcement because they're in direct contact sometimes with the evidence, even if they didn't see the killer or know it. They've touched the evidence in some way. And the prosecutor wasn't getting a good feeling about this at all. He didn't like that type of attention drawn to the homicide case, thought that, that it would get too much media, too much hype. It wasn't the direction that he really wanted to go. Gary and I then talked privately, and Gary said, what do you think? And I just said, do what you got to do. How can it hurt? How can it hurt? She might have some information here that will absolutely, you know, turn this thing around. And he went off to see Nancy. Gary Miko decides to defy the prosecutor and set up a meeting with Nancy. The discovery of Rachel Doma's body has turned the case of the missing girl into a full-scale homicide investigation. Prime suspect Michael Manfredonia has disappeared. Going against a direct order from the county prosecutor, Detective Gary Miko arranges a meeting with psychic Nancy Weber. He thinks she might hold the key to finding the murderer. But as he travels to meet her, doubts begin to creep in. Was there some something that she knew about this crime? Was she involved? Yeah, who knows? I didn't know. I mean, it, again, because of those reasons as well, it, it was worth meeting with her to see what she had. And I'm driving there, and I'm thinking, OK, so you're meeting somebody. You don't even know if it's Gary Miko. You've never met him before. You don't know if it's really a cop or some nut on the phone who called you. What are you doing? You're doing it anyhow. You know that. <laughs> and so I have this nice discussion as I'm driving there. And I pull up alongside him, and I have a handbag. And I get in his car. And as I get in, I see his, the inside of the car is a cop car. He's real. And he immediately, can I see your handbag? Thinking, OK, sure. What does he think I have, a gun? And I'm thinking, maybe a weapon. Let's make sure I'm not being tape recorded. Um, let's just get all this out of the way. So, uh, you know, this person who might be a publicity seeker or some sort of a problem individual, I just want to make sure that, you know, there's some safety zone here where I'm, I'm comfortable and she's comfortable. He hands me this wire, kind of noose-like wire. And I'm saying, it's Michael. This was his. He's used it. He wants to use it on him. He couldn't. It's suicidal. He's on the other side of the mountain where he killed her. He's on the opposite side. And as I see it, and I can still picture them, there are two huge drums. Normally, I can't tell you, but I knew 55-gallon drums, big drums. Now, she said, you know, he's, he can see you. He's, he's up on a hill. She paused. 
he, he's groggy. He's, he's out of it. He's, he's overdosed on something. Um, he's almost, you know, delirious or delusional. Or, she was just talking about how he was, his, his mindset, he's, he's physically, he was tired. He, was, he wanted to go home. He, 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 he can't go home because he knows you're there. You know, he, he sees police cars come and go. And uh, so he's afraid, but he, he desperately wants to come, go home. Sometime on Sunday evening, a decision was made to place a Chester Township police officer in the Manfredonia residence, just in case Michael came home again. And I grab a piece of paper, back of something, and I make a very rough sketch of where the gallons of drums are in a hill with pools of water. And she said, you're going to catch him. And she looked at me and she said, real soon, at that exact moment, my police radio, which had been quiet most of the night, on the police radio, you could hear that Chester Township officer on his walkie-talkie say, all units, he's in the home now. And I said to her, you have to leave, and sort of opened the door and kind of booted her out of the car and told her I'd be in touch and thank you. And Gary starts the car shifting, and I jumped out of the car, and he sped away, and that was it. As I'm racing towards the home, I'm thinking about this encounter and floored. By, by what just happened to me. Gary arrives on the scene just as Manfredonia is being put in an ambulance. He jumps in, reads Manfredonia his rights, and accompanies him to the hospital. Once again, Nancy Weber's prediction proved to be uncannily accurate. 72 hours after Rachel Domus was first reported missing, Gary Miko and George Duker have brought her killer to justice. For 11 years, the 11 years that followed Rachel's death. I tried to deny emotionally what I felt about this case. Feelings of being vulnerable, feelings of being a father of, of daughters, feeling of, again, this, the same thoughts and questions I had when I sat with Rachel at her crime scene. How could this happen? How could this happen? And could we have prevented it at all? No, it's, it's 20 years later, and it's, it's still close under the surface. It's still there. Nancy Weber had been right about a lot of things. Her psychic feeling that the killer was somehow connected with the smell of oil was spot on. Manfredonia was a car mechanic. The location where he was found was surrounded by oil drums, just as she had described. She was also correct about his being suicidal, Manfredonia told police that he wanted to take his own life, and he was high on an overdose of cold medicine when arrested. On Monday, September 16, 1985, Michael Manfredonia confessed to murdering Rachel Domus in a blinding, frenzied rage. He's currently serving a life sentence at New Jersey State Prison. A young mother disappears without a trace in Lake Oswego, Oregon. She's had a fight with her husband and walked out. She's missing, and so is the family car. Police suspect the husband. A local psychic's visions reveal there's been a murder. But will a partnership between the psychic and the cop put the killer behind bars? March 31st, 1986, the police in Lake Oswego, a wealthy suburb of Portland, Oregon, get a call from 28-year-old John Burke. He reports that after a late-night argument, his wife, Alexis, left in the family car. She hasn't been seen for three days. Local detective Robert Lee is assigned to the case. At that point in time, we didn't really know for sure that a crime had even been uh, committed. I mean, let's face it. Uh, couples split up. I mean, it happens every day. They have arguments. One or the other will take the family car and leave. But that theory just doesn't fit this situation. 
In this case, there was also a one and a half year old child that had Down syndrome, and it would be extremely unusual for any mother to leave her child. Alexis was a very beautiful woman. She was a person that would never stay gone for more than a few hours at a time. Lee and his investigators suspect the husband is being less than truthful about what happened three days earlier. John Burke was lying to me through his teeth. His reactions were real bad. His physiological responses did not match what he was saying. And my impression was that whatever happened to Alexis, John was responsible for it. And I went back and essentially knocked on the man's door to interview him. And I asked him if it was okay if the crime lab could take a look at the apartment. He said yes, and I signaled for the crime lab to come in, and we conducted our interview outside the apartment while the crime lab did their work on the inside. They found nothing suspicious, so they focus on finding the car that John Burke claims Alexis drove off in. We reasonably expected that if we found the car, we were going to find Alexis. Driven by increasing concern and frustrated at the lack of progress in the investigation, Alexis's mother takes an unusual step. A family friend recommends she call psychic Lori Macquarie. Over the phone, Lori immediately gets impressions about a very violent encounter. But the very first sense I got, even without a picture, just hearing Alexis's name, I felt that she was gone. I felt that very strongly. It's like a heaviness right in the middle of my chest. I described Alexis, her personality, which was a bit volatile, very intense. John, I thought, was lazy. I thought he was just a guy who was coasting through life, and he had absolutely no plans on changing anything. John was essentially unemployable by anybody but his own father, because John's work habits were atrocious, to say the least. He didn't want to show up if he didn't feel like it. I could see an argument between the husband and the wife. Laurie's view of the night Alexis disappeared matches with what John had been telling the police, but she sees more than the argument. What I felt with Alexis and John and the argument that I envisioned was that it was in part about finances, and a lot of people fight about finances. That's usually part of a marital situation. But this was fueled by someone being on drugs, alcohol, and I certainly felt that Alexis hadn't been using it. In fact, one of the points that I made to her mom is I said, this woman turned her life around recently. And she said, yes, that was true. And I said, well, I don't think the husband had. And I thought that he was a very weak person and that he was still using drugs. And that in itself was creating a problem in the marriage. I felt that there had been a horrific fight and that it had happened right there in the house and that she was no longer in that area. Within four days, police get a break. The family car has been abandoned in a rest area. Detective Lee finds it full of clues that just don't add up. Alexis was five feet, one inch tall and weighed approximately 115 pounds. She would have to be very close to the steering wheel to even reach the pedals. And yet the seat was pushed way to the back, like somebody my size or larger was actually driving the car. The ignition key was still in the ignition, and yet the doors were locked. From a police standpoint, that's what we call a proprietary interest in the car. Uh, somebody might purposely leave the keys in, but he wants to lock the doors because he doesn't want somebody to, to take his car. There was a open map with a city in Washington that was circled. The fact that the map was there to begin with was disturbing because to us it felt like a setup right off the bat. Although the car reveals unsettling information, Detective Lee knows he needs hard evidence a crime took place. We did get a couple of dogs to search the entire rest area to see if there was perhaps a, a body that was around there and came up with nothing. Detective Lee's case has gone cold, so when he gets a call from Alexis's mother saying she's contacted a psychic, he's skeptical but willing to listen. A police investigator really takes information, sometimes from oddball type sources, and runs with that information just to see if that information is any good, if it can be corroborated you know, by another direction. And I'm a left brain thinker. I'm very good with things that I can see and touch feel that make reasonable sense to me. So I contacted her by phone 
And I have to admit, I probably was a little bit more flippant than I probably should have been. I can remember that particular day, Detective Lee calling me and telling me that he was the detective working on the case, that he wanted to take me to lunch, and he wanted to check me out. It didn't sit well. Detective Lee is anxious to hear what Laurie has to say and convinces her to meet him for lunch. Mm. Laurie just wants to help find Alexis's body for her family. She told me an awful lot about my case. I see numbers. Laurie tells Detective Lee that she keeps seeing the number 15. He's intrigued. Alexis's car was found 15 miles from her home. Maybe that's the connection. I watched his body language. He removed his glasses and put them on the table. And I thought, gotcha. You're interested. Laurie has a flash of information about the car used so to transport Alexis's body. There's a larger car, older car, and as I'm almost looking at it, I'm back of it, and I'm seeing the trunk lid open, and it's a huge trunk. Detective Lee can't see the link. Alexis's car is a two-door with a small trunk, not the larger car Laurie's describing. When you're talking about a, a car, a big car, spend the next five minutes driving the highway and you'll see a hundred of them. Laurie's next bit of info makes Lee even more skeptical. She told me that the younger brother, Kelly, was involved. I had interviewed Kelly. Kelly was actually playing ball for the college that he attended in Southern California at the time of the disappearance of Alexis Burke. I can see the brother handling her body, helping carry it. I can see shovels involved, and I, I can see this family connection. We checked with the college. They verified the fact that Kelly was literally over a 1,000 miles away at the time. That automatically made eight or 10 of the other things that Lori told me that couldn't possibly be true simply because his involvement couldn't have been there. Detective Lee's investigation contradicts many of Laurie's clues, but Laurie is sticking to her guns. If she's right, Lee could be missing some crucial evidence. I remember telling him, it's going to be different than you think. It will bear me out. Wait and see. Laurie decides on a dangerous path. She takes the investigation into her own hands and arranges to meet the man she believes to be the killer. I just had to meet him. Alexis Burke, a young mother from a suburb of Portland, appears to vanish into thin air. While police suspect her husband, John, they have no evidence a crime has been committed. Alexis's mother contacts psychic Lori McQuarrie, hoping she'll be able to help police find her daughter. Lori decides she has no time to waste. Alexis's husband is packing up the apartment, preparing to rent it out, so Lori takes a risk. I knew the minute I met him, looked in his eyes, maybe if I was even fortunate enough to shake hands with him, I would get a further impression. The police found nothing when they searched the apartment. Now it's psychic Laurie's turn. He answered the door. He was very laid back. And I don't know if he was on drugs or not, but he was just very calm. And of course, I pretended to be a renter. As I went through that apartment, of course, I think not just as a psychic, but I think just as another human being, I thought, where is the wife's picture? Is there nothing here? There was nothing, not a thing of hers there, nothing. And she had only been missing a couple of months, nothing. Lori's observations are chilling. And I thought, how cold. You've already buried her, not only literally, but symbolically. She's gone from your life. When I turned to leave and thanked him, I shook his hands. And when I held his hand, I can just feel these around her neck. I know that's how he murdered her. My reaction when Lori told me that she'd gone to the apartment and met John was one of utter disbelief. Here was a person that even she thought was a murderer. And I was convinced of it at that point, and yet she's going up and making contact with him in an apartment. I was very upset. After going to the apartment, that's when I began to get stronger and stronger feelings about where she was buried. But I still was a basic skeptic. I believe what I can see, what I can prove. Still, he's willing to listen. 
Can the psychic help Detective Lee find the body? One iota, nothing of her belongings there. Once or twice a week, we would sit and hypotheses with each other about what I think happened here and what he thinks. One of the things that Lori had come up with right off the bat was 1-5. She didn't know whether the 1-5 meant Interstate 5, whether it was 1.5 miles, or what the significance of the 15 was. In this case, 15 could very easily have been, we're about 15 miles from the place where we thought the death had occurred. And there was a place called Bell's Landing. Bell's Landing, according to Lori, was an important item as far as the relationship between John and Alexis was concerned. Detective Lee and psychic Lori Macquarie didn't know if they were looking for an actual place or not. It was like searching for a needle in a haystack. Maybe this is interesting. Well, right down the way over here is where John and Alexis used to spend an awful lot of time. In Oregon, Bell's Landing could either be the side of a mountain where they park machinery when they're clear-cutting an area or doing a logging operation. It could also be a landing alongside of a river. And in this area of Oregon, we have some very, very large rivers, so it's quite plausible that there would be a landing named Bell's uh, somewhere. That's the frustrating part. Sometimes I get the clues, sometimes I get the symbologies, and it's up to me to make it fit. It's up to me to do the interpretation. And it isn't always like a teletype. I wish it were. We even went out on a couple of searches together in areas out as where she had lived previously, which is not very far from here. So he made the effort. He was at least cooperative and open. You know, it's part of what I saw, but I don't think this is the spot. So you're not actually getting any... Uh, I'm of... not getting any vibes, let's put it that way. Lori told very specifically that the body was buried. Her head was just inches away from a little creek. I also felt that he had buried her where he could watch her. That meant an awful lot to us, but what exactly did it mean? Did it mean he could keep an eye on it from work? Was it near his home? And it was about that time that I was really talking to him about it's in a field, it's, there's a building, but it's not a regular building like you would just walk in and do business in. The more time they spend together, the more Detective Lee trusts Laurie's visions. They match his own hunches about the husband. She has an insight into people and places and things that I don't even understand. The scenario will play out. I will see the person, I will see the circumstances. Sometimes the reception may become a little hazy. It isn't always crystal clear. It may come in and out, but it's exactly like watching a television show. I could see him eating his lunch. He goes out there, eats his lunch, and watches the sight. The sight is, is within range, he can see it. And as long as it's not disturbed, he knows he's not in trouble. It looks like John is going to get away with murder, but Laurie's psychic instincts tell her he's made a big mistake. This was something where many people knew what had happened. Laurie is convinced John has told someone about the murder. Detective Lee rethinks the investigation and decides on a new approach. We used an awful lot of what we would consider to be behavioral analysis on John. We knew that if we applied pressure to John, that his past history would indicate that he would talk to somebody. And yet we didn't want to put so much pressure on him that he was going to invoke his rights per Miranda, which in the United States is a pretty big thing simply because it meant that we were no longer able really to talk directly to John without the interference of an attorney. I've always thought, you know, sometimes the best crimes in the world have been solved by the girlfriend who was dumped. And I knew that John had had a girlfriend. Just as Laurie predicted, that's exactly what happened. A former girlfriend of John Burke was living with some girls that were attending college, and she mentioned to one of the girls that she had a former boyfriend who had killed his wife. This girl contacted another girlfriend who talked to another girlfriend about it, who talked to another girlfriend about it. The sixth girlfriend in line contacted her father. The father of this girl contacted the police department. Based on the father's tip, police track down John's former girlfriend, Julie, and bring her to Portland. 
She agrees to cooperate, and they arrange to tape her phone conversations with John. He said that he'd strangled uh, his wife. Julie got the impression that the body was buried. We were driving by the metal fabrication plant where John and his younger brother worked. And Julie mentioned that John became very different every time that they went by that area. But John's confession to his old girlfriend isn't enough. Police still need a body to get a conviction. Lori sees Alexis buried somewhere where John can keep a close watch on her. It makes sense it would be close to where he worked. Following his own intuition and Lori's clues, Detective Lee decides to search the 15 acres beside the plant. Maybe this is the clue 15 Lori keeps seeing. It has a very, very large metal fabrication building with very little in the way of vegetation. The 15 acres that was right next to it was ideal because the trees and the brush provided an awful lot of cover and concealment. Access was pretty much restricted. We sent uh, cadaver dogs over the 15 acres, and their handlers came back with essentially nothing. I was personally disappointed that we were not able to find the body. As Detective Lee and I would talk throughout the year occasionally about the case, of course, there would be times when he felt that maybe John was going to crack. And I would just always share with him my philosophy. Everything happens when it's supposed to. It's a real low point in the investigation. Without Alexis's body, police can't charge John with murder. But Lori is sure John's younger brother, Kelly, is involved, despite the fact he's given police what appears to be an airtight alibi. I think Kelly just happened to be the wrong guy at the wrong time, and he was related to the murderer. And so he helped dispose of her body. Kelly was in Southern California during the specific time frame that Alexis disappeared. And a reasonable person would believe that Kelly could not have had any involvement simply because of the time frames. He was literally over a thousand miles away at the time. I generally find what I get as a first impression is correct. And I remember telling him, I'm standing by it. It's been a year since Alexis Burke went missing after an argument with her husband, John. With the case going cold and based on her track record, Detective Lee decides to listen to psychic Laurie Macquarie and take another look at the brother's story. John essentially has no friends of his own. His best friend in the world is his younger brother. If the younger brother knows anything about it, that would automatically mean that his best friend would know all about the case. Kelly's friends and former roommates are all law students. They've been interviewed once about the disappearance of Alexis. This time, Detective Lee re-interviews them with a grand jury subpoena in his hand, threatening each with jail time if they refuse to cooperate. From what Kelly's friends have to say, it becomes very clear that Kelly knows something. He's brought in for questioning, and Detective Lee persuades him to cooperate. He told me everything I wanted to know. Yes, he was in Southern California uh, playing ball, but the game had gotten rained out. He was actually back in Oregon 24 hours earlier than he was supposed to be. It is a turning point for the investigation. If it hadn't been for Lori's conviction, police might never have re-interviewed the brother, and his information was just what they needed to get an arrest. Bob Lee does not give compliments lightly, but he did kind of offer that up and say, well, I guess you were right. And, and I just felt that there was a shift at that point. The deal we made with Kelly was very simple. We were concerned that because the body had been in the ground for so long that we would not be able to formally identify Alexis Burke. The dental records we had were several years old. We knew there were not going to be any fingerprints. There was not going to be anything that was actually going to tell us for certain that this was Alexis Burke and not somebody else. And that would be a loophole that a defense attorney would be able to drive a truck through. So we essentially made a deal with Kelly that we would not prosecute him in any way, shape, or form for his complete assistance in the case, including showing us where the body was. I felt that there had been a horrific fight. Kelly confirms Laurie's original vision of a strangulation. He tells Detective Lee how a family argument escalated into murder. Alexis walked out the front door, slammed the door behind her. When she got to the car, she didn't have car keys, and she was in her nightgown. So she came back and started screaming at John. 
He had big hands. I can just feel these around her neck. I know that's how he murdered her. He came over to her and put his hands around her neck. John said to shut her up because she was really making a lot of noise. John says he ripped off the electrical cord and tied it around Alexis's neck just to make sure that she was dead. The body was rolled up in the carpet behind the couch for at least 36 hours. During that time frame, that at least 12 members of his family and her family were in the apartment. When Kelly finally showed up, he helped John dispose of the body just as Lori had envisioned. There's a larger car, older car. They put the body of Alexis into the back of their father's car, which was a very large Lincoln, dark in color. They then took the body out in the middle of the night and actually dug a hole about 75 yards from the corner of the building where they both worked and buried Alexis. There's water involved and not a large body of water. The body was right next to a very, very small rivulet of water. The head was the closest to that water and it was only several feet away. And of course, the body was under just several inches of dirt. Lori's visions are accurate about all the important details of the case. The brother's involvement, the larger car the body had been moved in, Alexis's body buried in a shallow grave near water, and about John keeping an eye on the site. He was able to keep an eye on the situation because he went there every single day. But John Burke still isn't in custody. Because he was out of town, he is oblivious to the discovery of the body. As it was, John showed up the next day, and he was totally in the dark. And by the time he found out about it, it was too late. And I told him he was under arrest for the murder of his wife. And I put on a pair of brand new handcuffs on him. That felt really good. John Burke is convicted of his wife's murder and sentenced to 13 years in jail. His brother, Kelly, gets off scot-free because he cooperated with police. With this murder solved, Detective Bob Lee isn't quite as flippant about Laurie's psychic abilities. I contacted Laurie to tell her, you know, all about the case and how terrifically accurate she was at that point on 28 of the 30 things that she had told me. I don't know if I feel vindicated so much as I just feel, yes, this stuff does work. And it's important for me to be right, not just for me, but I think it's important for the victim. Psychic Laurie may be good at predicting the future, but not when it comes to herself. Detective Lee was so impressed with her abilities, he proposed marriage. I never for a heartbeat thought when I met him that I was going to end up with him. We've been married now for a little over 18 years. We're a good team. 